Hello, everyone, and inside today's episode of Locked On Canadians, we have the weekend recap, and then it is three up and three down. Some veterans are thriving, some are struggling. Let's find out who inside today's show. You are Locked On Canadians, your daily podcast on the Montreal Canadiens, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 948 of Locked on Canadians. Today's episode is brought to you by our friends at Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked on NHL for $20 off your first purchase today. I am, of course, one of your hosts. I am Scott Matla. I am flying solo this week. My co-host, the active stick, Laura Saba, is on vacation. So if you are new here, there are two of us. And if you are new here, I have something for you. You can find us wherever you find your daily podcast, Google, Apple, Spotify. We will be there every single morning. Or if you prefer watching things on YouTube while you are working, we are there as well. You can subscribe at Locked On Canadians on YouTube. See our shining faces every single morning there. But it is time to get into things. This is, of course, your daily Montreal Canadiens podcast and sometimes Laval Rocket podcast. And 100% of the time, big fans of Cole Caulfield podcast. Rough week for the Canadians. They go 0-2-1 on the week. Two regulation losses to teams that were very beatable for them. They are now 5-5-2 on the season. They lost 6-3 to the St. Louis Blues on Saturday night in a game that's notable for a lot of reasons and frustrating for a lot of reasons. And I guess we'll start with where the downside is, and there will be a lot more of this in the the down section of three up and three down today is that defensively the guy they needed to be the load bearing veteran on this team Mike Matheson is is just not it right now and there's a lot going wrong with that that is causing this team to be less efficient leaving their zone less efficient uh, moving the puck to the neutral zone in the offensive zone mistakes just things that aren't that aren't making sense that did not happen last year, even as bad as that team was, this is not mistakes that we saw last year all the time. And I think that's an incredibly frustrating part of what's going on right now, but this is a game where it's just mental mistakes kind of cost them. Everything is that when the chips got up, they got frustrated. They, you know, fell kind of into a, I don't want to call it a rut, but I think that is the best way to do it, is that they were competing, 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 and then it was a couple of quick blues goals, and then you get to see the legs go out the building. And I think what's most frustrating about this game for me is that the blues played last night, just like Arizona had played the night before earlier this week, and the Canadians looked like this looked like the tired team coming off of rest into this game. And that's a problem. That's a huge problem for this team here. And because they're starting slow and they're not able to always dig themselves out of it. They've done it a couple times this year, and I don't know if it was just dumb luck. It is probably a little bit of luck because that's how hockey goes sometimes. But it is frustrating because I know this team is better than losing 6-3 to a team on a back-to-back. And I wanted – there's a lot that needs to be fixed, I think, in this. Number one on that is the power play has regressed back again. They allowed two shorthanded goals on Saturday, which is – absolutely reprehensible yet again i'm pretty sure the canadians penalty kill is or power play is getting outscored on this season which is a problem and a half and continues to be is that something needs to happen and that permeates down a level two with the laval rocket trust me they also had a very interesting week uh at at hand but i want to i i see good things happen I see good things from Caden Gooley and good things from Sean Monaghan and Caulfield and Suzuki, et cetera. And then I see, and I don't want to be too harsh on Christian Dvorak. It was his first game back and more on that in a second, but turnover leads to a scoring play the other way. Failed clears passes that don't make sense. A lot of it is Mike Matheson. What are you doing at the blue line kind of things? And just every error bit them, which 
is a, is probably the harshest teacher that you can have is that if you make a play and you don't get punished for it, you go, okay, maybe I can get away with it. If you get punished for making a bad play, chances are you're going to remember that in your head more often than not. And it, it overshadows some very good stuff from this game. Unfortunately, that they were so poor overall. And the biggest thing about it is that I think should highlight this game is Uri Slavkovsky got put on the top line wing spot with Cole Caulfield and Nick Suzuki immediately looked like a better player. I'm not declaring that this is the, the perfect solution for this and that yes, Slavkovsky on the top line. It seems pretty simple that this is the right idea for that, but he looked immediately better. And as uh, Nathan from eyes on the prize put, as we were talking in Slack is that he's seeing what Caulfield and Suzuki are doing, playing in different channels and is filling the spot there. Whereas with Josh Anderson, whom and Alex Newhook, who do not have that structure to their game because they're both wingers. One of them is not a true center. He's trying to fill a center role. He's not a center. He doesn't have the instinct spots for that. Playing with Caulfield and Suzuki, he's able to easily read what their patterns are and what they're doing to fill the space that he needs to to be an effective winger on this team. And you know what? It's great because guess what? He scored a goal. He scored his first goal of the season being on that top line. And that's what you want to see immediately being put in a situation and immediately making the most of it. That's such a huge key for for this team here. And especially for Uri Slavkovsky is that I don't know if it's long-term fit. Because this is a one-game sample size. Did I like what I see in this one game? Absolutely. I loved what I saw in this. I I don't mind Alex Newhook in that uh, top-line wing spot either. Because I I like Alex Newhook as a winger, not so much as a center. But I don't want to stick Slavkovsky back in a line that is with, you know, Josh Anderson, who does not complement his play style. Too many guys are playing north-south which is great. It's speed, it's pace, it's tenacity. And Slavkovsky plays a little bit more of an East-West game with his frame and his ability to slow the game down a little bit. And I think that, I almost wonder if they move Pearson to a different line or Gallagher to a different line and put Slavkovsky with Sean Monaghan, whose smarts and ability open up lanes and opportunities there. I don't think that's a bad idea either, but the biggest thing is Slavkovsky got on the top line, scored a goal, should probably remain there. And it's going to be a very tough week ahead for the Canadians because they play four games this week. So let me take a look. Technically, they play four games this week. If we're counting today, November 5th, a week from now, as in that same week here at 7 p.m. Play the Lightning on Tuesday. They play the Red Wings on Thursday. The Bruins on Saturday. And then the Canucks on Sunday. The last two games are at home. Well, the first game is at home as well, and then they travel to Detroit on Thursday. That back-to-back is going to be dangerous. The Canucks power play is lethal, and the Canadians' penalty kill is much less than that. However, it's a good week to see how can we bounce back. Are we going to rise up to these teams here? Because I look at how they rose up to the challenge against Vegas, put in a great effort against a very good team, Took them to a shootout, lost. Okay. Tampa Bay is not what they once were, still a good team. They're going to give you a test. Uh, They they still can score goals. They beat up on Ottawa this weekend. They won, I believe, 6-4, 7-4 on Saturday night. Detroit has one of the best offenses in the NHL this year. Dylan Larkin and uh, Alex Dabrinkat are absolutely thriving there and it's going to be they're they're a team that looks like they're turning the corner but i'm still not sold yet and then you have the bruins who somehow have just one regulation loss on the season they're always a tough team they're going to be a headache i'm very interested to see what they do with that and then vancouver like i said the surprise team i think this year is that i wasn't expecting much from vancouver again but early season vibes are vancouver's dangerous One of the best defensemen in the NHL in terms of point production, Quinn Hughes. Elias Pettersson's on fire, an offense that is lethal. It's going to be a team that, hey, the Canadians, you cannot make mistakes. There's a big learning week ahead for the Montreal Canadiens. And there's several players who are going to need to learn some harsh lessons this week because it is Monday. That means three up and three down. And coming up in our next segment, we're going to get into the downs for the week. But first, as I said earlier, today's show is brought to you by Game Time. 
it's always a nuisance sometimes trying to buy tickets last minute for an event. I've had to do it for Bills games and for hockey games, and it can be frustrating. You can't tell if you're going to be in good seats and the price is worth it compared to anything else, or if there's even a deal out there to find. Well, guess what? Game time is here for you because it's the easiest and fastest way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater events near you. You can get killer last minute deals, all in prices, views from your seat, and the best price guarantee. Game time is going to take all the guesswork out of buying tickets. So when you go in and let's say you want to go to that show, you can see what your seats look like, it, where the values are, and there is lowest price guaranteed, event cancellation protection and job loss protection, et cetera. So you have faith in what you are buying. All you got to do is download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code LOCKEDONNHL for $20 off your first purchase. Some terms apply, and all you have to do is create an account with Game Time and redeem code LOCKEDONNHL for $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last-minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. We are back here at Locked On Canadians, or at least I am back. I am your host for this week. I am Scott Matla. Of course, you can follow me on the app, formerly known as Twitter, at Scott Matla, where I mostly post clips of animals and hockey games because it's it's not worth spending that much time there. Today is Monday, and for those of you who have been here since the start, you know Monday is three up and three down, where we keep recap the best and worst and I say worst, that sounds so mean, but the struggling bits from last week uh, in this show, and we always start with the down because we don't want to harp on the negative for too long. And the biggest thing this week is, and I feel bad doing this because I love the guy to death because he is very clearly the best possible defenseman the Canadians have right now, but he is struggling so mightily this year. Mike Matheson. Watching the game against the Blues and the Coyotes was a it it was something. It's like somebody turned all of his sliders off. That there's no hockey sense. There's no balance. There's no composure. Just Mike Matheson, who last year was a lot better at covering for the mistakes of his partners, struggling to do even the basic parts of his job. Against the Blues, I watched him come into the zone towards two defenders and try to spin, fall down, puck goes the other way. He gets back in the play because he can skate really well. Great. Jonathan Kovacevic points that he's got this guy coming on his side of the ice there. Matheson, instead of picking up, I believe it was Brandon Saad at, on his side of the net, goes to cover the same guy who is passing across. Neither guy gets coverage there, gets a stick on the puck. Sod scores into the empty net on Samuel Montembeau, who was kind of left out to dry on the play. And it's just all these bewildering mistakes that he didn't make last year. I know Mike Matheson is better than these errors that he's making in this game right now. Like, I truly know that for a fact. Is he's got to be better. Like, he has to be better than what he is doing there. And... I know David Savard is out, which is a wild thing that Matheson's numbers have actually gotten worse without David Savard on the ice there. There's something to be said that I don't know if he's still playing through that nagging injury or not, but if there were times they should have sat him to rest, it should have been this week. If you're going to lose, fine. Losing while one of your key players plays injured potentially, and I, I do not know for a fact if he is still nursing this injury, but something is not right in the way that he plays. Just the way that he's making plays, just the way that he's playing in general, he looks like he is trying to play through something, and that that shouldn't be a thing that they're doing right now. And going hand-in-hand hand with that is my other down, one of my other downs this week. The power play at both levels of the Canadians organization is abysmal. I watched the Rocket this week, I think, score maybe one power play goal. And they had, between Saturday, Friday and Saturday alone, they had at least 12 power play opportunities and put up an offer. On the flip side of thing, the Rocket penalty kill was elite. It was outstanding, allowing only one power play goal on the weekend and a bunch of opportunities surrendered as well. But the power play isn't working at either level. And part of that at the NHL level is Mike Matheson is not where he needs to be. And another name is on power play one. He is also on the down list. I will get to him in a moment. 
And in Laval, I just, they don't trust the right guy to be running power play one. Both Logan Mayu and Matthias Norlander looked great in that role early on in the season, in the preseason. They've been relegated to role two behind William Trudeau, who is playing terribly, to be quite frank with everything, in that Trudeau then comes back. He missed Friday's game, comes back in on Saturday's game, right back on power play one, still not playing well. It's a very frustrating thing, but at the NHL level, there's too much talent for it to not be working. It's getting scored on, and some of that ties into Matheson is not playing to the level that he is capable of. You need to take risks on the power play to generate better chances, but I wouldn't even qualify what he's doing as risks more as it's he's trying things and it's just not working. Everything feels like they're playing as a group of individuals rather than as a cohesive unit. And again, I know that they're probably still just below league average on the power play, which is what I asked for. But when you see what it looks like when it's clicking so well, guys like Monaghan working there, guys like Slavkovsky scoring goals, maybe even someone like Jesse Ullinen, who is a great shooter in the press box for the game against the Blues, it becomes very frustrating that they can't figure this out. And a big part of that is the insistence in Josh Anderson being on power play one, because my final down for the week is Josh Anderson is just, I, I don't know what it is. He just doesn't seem to fit on any of the lines here. And I, I cannot wrap my head around why, because everything is there in the speed, the power, the ability to shoot, but defensively he can't cover And for whatever reason this year, he isn't utilizing his most effective weapon, which is his shot. He is constantly trying to cut across the face of net, and he does not have the agility in the hands to pull that off consistently. I think it is great that he's trying to improve his position and try to find a better scoring chance. But if you were Josh Anderson flying in off the wing and your power is in a heavy wrist shot or a snapshot while you were at full speed, Slowing down to cut across the net to try and bring it to your backhand and roof it when that is not your strength is is an issue there. It is commendable that he wants to try and create that space or create a rebound or force the goalie to make a harder save, but you are known for coming in and ripping that puck off the wing. I've watched you do it a lot, and it is where your strength is. I want him to stick to that. And I. the hardest part is the Canadians got to find somebody to work with him. The top line, probably not a great solution for it. We know it doesn't always work. We know it doesn't work with Alex Newhook as a center. Christian Dvorak just came back, which, great, he's been out since, you know, last spring, I believe, or late last, late last winter, early spring last year. Comes back in his first game, he has, you know, Newhook and Anderson there. And because I'm not I'm not crazy about the idea of breaking up Monaghan, Gallagher, and Pearson because they've been a very efficient third line. But the problem is they might need to take the talents of all three of these guys, the complementary piece in in Pearson, Monaghan being a very smart play driver, and Gallagher just being a guy who generates shots and shots and shots. I can't help but think that maybe they need to just kind of disperse these pieces here and bat- bring balance to the lines a little bit. But they gotta find a home for Josh Anderson. Something has to click, and maybe he just needs a goal or two. Hell, if he wants to score three against the Bruins, that would be great. He's not going to – it's it's not going to come easily, basically, is because teams know they can hone in on Suzuki and everybody without Kirby Doc here. They need somebody else to step up, and they need that to be, you know, Josh Anderson right now. If Josh Anderson can come in and get his goal-scoring game on track, this week, it's going to do a lot for helping bring the Canadians back a little bit. I don't think he's an option on power play one. I don't. I think that every time he goes in there is that his style is to play on the rush and on the counter attack. The power play is about cycling and precision and finesse. And Anderson is like bringing a sledgehammer to, you know, hang one of your child's little, you know, paintings on the wall there. You need a little tippy tap and Anderson just comes in and his sledgehammers a hole through your wall there. I want to see them make that change just because it, it'll it should kill two birds with one stone to use you know that old cliche a little bit here. But if he can get going, the team looks a lot better. But for right now, I just don't know where he fits, and they're not going to healthy scratch a five and a half million dollar guy. He's not hurt. He's just 
not fitting. I think he's last on the team forwards for expected goals for. Not great uh, for a guy that you're expecting to be a 20-plus goal guy a year. However, because it is three up and three down, we don't always stick with the negative. We're going to get into the rising stars of this week, and that's coming up next. But first, today's show is also brought to you by our friends at FanDuel. And right now, new customers with FanDuel can get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet because we want you to score early this NFL season with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. That's 150 bucks if your team wins. And if you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there's no better time to get in on the action than right now. The app's easy to use. There's a wide range of betting options, including the spread, player props, over, under, and more. I, y'all know I am a Packers fan. Bet on anybody taking the over against the Packers defense this year. Jordan Love is struggling. I'm telling you, there's money to be made there. All you have to do is visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and kick off the NFL season with FanDuel, the official sportsbook partner of the NFL, and us here at Locked On. And I am also here to remind you to please gamble responsibly anytime you are betting on sports. It is the final segment of today's show. It is the up part of three up and three down. And I want to start with defensemen, but I realize that in my uh, show notes on the side here, the screen, if you are watching this on YouTube, I put the resurgence of Brendan Gallagher in there. And you know what? I'm going to lead with that. Even though the two defensemen I want to talk about, I know people have been asking about a ton. I, I ended last segment kind of talking about the the trio of Tanner Pearson, Sean Monahan, and Brendan Gallagher. Sean Monahan is getting a lot of the accolades, and rightfully so. He's been incredible this season when he has been healthy now. Uh, he's up to six goals on the year in 10 or 12 games now, winning a ton of faceoffs, just generally looking really, really smart for the Canadians this year. And as Andrew Berkshire pointed out, is that Sean Monahan is getting accolades, and rightfully so. He's been very good. Brendan Gallagher looks like he's kind of back to his old form again. He's second on the team. He's third on the team in expected goals for. He's second on the team in Corsi four percentage. He's doing the things that Brendan Gallagher always did well, and that is just generating scoring chances when that when he has the puck. Are they always high danger chances? No, but is he always there to put pucks on net, create havoc, and do all the little things that help lines score goals? Yes. Yes, he is. And I am so glad to see that he is not struggling like we saw in the first couple games of the year. There were games that I'm watching Brendan Gallagher skate and all I can think is it's over. There is nothing left in that guy's lower body to keep him going here. And then in the last handful of games here, since I said that, and I said on the show with Laura that it was hard to watch Brendan Gallagher he has come out and just been phenomenal. Maybe not as fast as he once was, but he's scoring good goals. His shots look good. He's creating opportunities. He's not getting hurt, knock on wood. And I think that that third line there, uh, Tanner Pearson's a really nice complimentary player. He's not going to drive play, but he does enough little things right with that kind of veteran smarts that that third line being a secondary scoring group is a huge boon for the Canadians. I think Pearson's got three or four goals on the year. Gallagher's got four or five now, I believe. And then uh, Sean Monaghan has six. It's a pretty good unit, all things considered. Considering I looked at that and I go, trade bait, trade bait, possible trade bait on that line. And we know two of those names, there's only a year on their contract, are likely going to be gone at the trade deadline. That's That wouldn't be shocking, but... If Brendan Gallagher is going to be here, it is good to see that he is finding his legs and finding his game there. And his success means that if he continues to play well, they can always move, shuffle lines around, create opportunities to put him with Suzuki and Caulfield, the guy that's going to go to the net, cash in on some of those rebounds and, you know, cause havoc to open up lanes. Not a bad idea. Pairing him with Slavkovsky, someone that they know Gallagher is going to go to the net. If I can put pucks there, there's going to be a guy there. Gallagher's flexibility, and I said this about Rafael Harvey Pinard too, is that the more flexible they are, the more opportunities they can definitely create for this team, and that's a good thing. Uh, also on the upside, I'm saving the best for last on this. I'm reordering it from what's in the show description because this is my show and I can do what I want. Uh, Logan Mayu had his best professional game, I thought, on Friday night against the Toronto Marlies, and a lot of people have been asking, how has he looked this year? How has he been playing? There are still hockey IQ brain farts. There are, 
That's just fact of the matter. That is how development sometimes goes here. And I still look at a lot of what he has done as a player. And I am seeing someone who I, I see what this player development staff wants out of him is there's been a lot less trying to play hero puck a little bit. He still does it from time to time, but he is picking his spots better. Uh, he was a big reason why the rocket had a, uh, Third period, four goal, four unanswered goal comeback against the Toronto Marlies. And part of that started with Mayu getting a puck from the point. Brandon Giniak rims it around the boards to Mayu at the point, And he cuts like he's going to go to the middle, cuts to his back foot, and puts a shot on net for a rebound. It rebounds right to Philippe Maye. Maye lifts it, finally gets his first goal of the year, gets that comeback started. That gets the rocket within a goal. And then Jan Misch ties it up. And then it was late in the game. Sim play there. Brandon Ginia kind of wins a puck along the corner boards uh, behind the Marley's net, chips it to the point. Mayu is basically at that, that 90 degree angle where the blue line meets the boards and the benches there. Steps to his back foot and wires one right through traffic about chest high. Philippe Maye gets a stick on it, deflects it uh, by Martin Jones. Rocket take the lead. They end up getting a win with a Brandon Giniak empty netter. And that's kind of what I want to see from Mayu there is smart decision making on defense is he's he's making good reads with his passes with his shots he's looking to find lanes he's not just firing it into people he is looking to improve his scoring position and I know the offense is where his key is his shot is heavy it is absolutely ridiculous having now watched it more and more often as his decision making gets better as he learns to get more comfortable in the defensive zone, making reads, I'm not saying he's ever going to become a stalwart defensive player, but it's less and less. He's unplayable more and more. Okay. We can iron out these brain farts. I thought uh, a stronger game for him on Friday night. And a lot of people have asked, how is he playing? He's been better than I've expected. There is still work to go, but he is probably a few steps ahead of where I would have placed him going into this season. And unfortunately for Mayu, he is not going to be the young prospect defenseman grabbing all the headlines for Canadians fans this weekend because Lane Hudson, Hobie Baker season is back in full swing again. Hudson scored four goals in two games this weekend, including a hat trick against ranked North Dakota on Saturday night. When I say Lane Hudson is a cheat code, I think I might actually be underselling how good Lane Hudson is. Watching him play again, all the goals that he scored against North Dakota were he's at the blue line, shimmies, shakes around a defender, Lane wires one home by the goalie there. Just the most impressive thing is he he puts the fear of God in players twice his size. He they players see Hudson approaching and they don't want to give him too much space or try and jump on him too much because they're always worried what he's going to do. And to be quite frank, I never know what he's going to do half the time because he has so many tricks in his tool bag that Lane Hudson is becoming just a nuisance in the best possible way for opposing teams. And I am trying my best to kind of contain the hype around Lane Hudson for myself because yeah, there's probably going to be a little bit of adjustment time to the professional game and see how those next steps go there. I want to see him next to Caden Gooley so badly. I want to see him playing with David Reinbacher, with Jaden Struble, et cetera. Some of these, you know, stable guys who can move the puck, but allow Lane Hudson to be Lane Hudson. And I, it's hard to not feel giddy. And it's not hard to think that he's a leading candidate for the Hobie Baker this year. And if he's not, I have a lot of thoughts about the process of that. And I know it's what seven games or six games into the NCAA. I don't care. Lane Hudson, Hobie Baker season. Cause he did this not against like some smaller school, all respect to, you know, some of the other teams they've played, but in North Dakota this is one of the rank top ranked teams in the NCAA hockey world, a very good team year in and year out. And Lane Hudson's just like, ah, what if I score casually score a hat trick? Always going to be on the up list when you do stuff like that. That is going to bring a wrap to the show though. Who's on your up list this week. Who's on your down list. You can tweet us at L O underscore Canadians, locked on Canadians at gmail.com. Leave it in the YouTube comments. If you want to put your three up and three down in the titles of your comments there, we will take a look at those. I will be back 
with another show on Monday night. We've got Bruins preview. We've got tons of game recaps this week. Might have a special guest coming in this week. We've got some leftover mailbag questions that I'm going to try to get to as well. Full week of content planned with me here. Don't worry, Laura will be back soon. And folks, thank you for listening. We will see you all next time. Mm -hmm.